So what did that apology mean, if anything, to his victims? So happy to welcome in a very special guest, the attorney who represents the family of Gloria Satterfield, Eric Bland. Uh, Eric, first of all, I just want to say what a marvelous advocate you have been. It was a real treat to watch you yesterday. And you said so many things that were on the minds of so many of us who've been following this case about these victims finally getting justice. Uh, so bravo to you for everything you've done for your clients. And I'm curious, did you find his apology as insincere as I found it and many of our wonderful viewers found it to be? It was hollow. Um, this is the, the words of a narcissist. I don't know if you saw it, but I got up and left in the middle of it and I made a statement that I probably shouldn't have. I said it was horse crap, but I used another word. Um, this was you know, a dress rehearsal for him and a PR infomercial for the motion for a new trial coming up. And ultimately, if he's granted a new trial, how he will testify in front of the new jury and in front of the public. He's trying to change his image. It didn't work in the first jury trial of the murder case. And he's trying to show that he's a uh, a, a different kind of guy, but it came as insincere. And I think if you heard the ju the words of uh, Judge Newman, who said, "I don't know who you are, and I don't think you know who you are. You're you're an enigma and enigmatic, and I, I'm just at a loss because it's just a shame of the person that's standing in front of me. And he 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 put in words what everybody in the courtroom were was feeling because it went way beyond just talking about the victims of the theft that he pled guilty to. He gave an open letter to Buster and talked about, you know, everything was about him and what he's doing. And then he did, uh, you know, a, a therapy session on drugs and talked about how you rehab. And it was really uh, too much. I think his lawyers did uh, let him go on way too long, and I think the judge let him let go on so he could hang himself. It was absolutely offensive to me, and I know to so many of our wonderful viewers who have wanted to see justice for your clients, all of the other tremendous people that he wronged so badly. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned the apology to Buster too, Eric, because that was one of those jaw-dropping moments like, wow, he's really using this to his advantage. I have a little clip uh, from it. It's short. I want to play it for our audience now. Hey, Buster. I am so sorry that I let you down. I am so sorry that I did so many things that are so contradictory to every single thing mom and I ever taught you. You know, sure, Buster deserves an apology, but was this the time and place yeah. for it, right? Uh, Eric, what was no. what was Tony saying to you, you know, about all this? I mean, what a great kid. America loves him. People around the world love him. We have so many viewers, as you know, in the United Kingdom and in other uh, countries abroad that have uh, just had their hearts broken knowing what he's had to endure. What did he think about the apology and all of it? Well, you know, uh, through the process of you being an, a solicitor and a prosecutor and then an attorney, practicing attorney, you see the development of your clients and you see them grow in front of you. When I met Tony, Tony couldn't even talk in front of the camera. He, he had an inability to articulate how he was feeling and uh, he would always say, OK, you say it, you say it. I mean, he spoke from the heart. I had no idea what he was going to say. I had no idea how he was going to confront Alex. In fact, you know, the judge basically said, you're supposed to look at me, uh, meaning the judge, when you talk and don't address the attorneys or Alex Murdoch. That was a objection that Dick had made because he heard that I was going to take off on Alex and, and the attorneys a little bit. But when Tony said to the judge, can I look him in the eye? Because when I want to speak to somebody, I want to I want to look at them. And he just absolutely lit him up, Julie. Um, and then when he said, I'd like to do my own letter of apology that's more sincere than your insincere letter that you sent me. And then the way G Ginger, who went to uh, school with him, just like Jordan Jenks, my other client who was so articulate, um, you know, asked, 
why? Why would you do this? And Jordan called him an animal. I mean, it was as good a victim impact statements as I've ever heard. And, you know, you would have loved it when, if you were in Creighton's position when you were a prosecutor to get that kind of victim impact statement. The only downside was it was a negotiated plea. And the choice was if Judge Newman varied from the 27 years and gave him more, they would have been able to back out of the plea. So I, I think if it wasn't a negotiated plea, the statements from the victims, not me, would have uh, gotten him close to 30, 40 years. Wow. Well, I believe it, Eric. I believe it. Uh, and you were right. This is a very stiff sentence. This is good because it could be effectively a life sentence if anything were to go wrong with the homicide case. We know that he thinks he's getting a don't retrial. Forget, don't forget, Jules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell me. Don't forget, you got the federal court sentence that's coming in that's February right. from Judge Gergel. Yes. He pled guilty on 22 counts, and Judge Gergel's going to light him up. So if he lives to 77 years old, mm -hmm. he walks out of state prison, and he marches right over to federal prison. Plus, there's still the Labor Day shooting felony charges out there that he's going to have to deal with. So Alex will never get that fresh breath of air ever again, and I think all of us, or a large majority of us, will be very happy about that. Absolutely, Eric. He's dangerous. He's a dangerous killer. He needs to stay behind bars. Uh, and thank you for those reminders that Labor Day shooting, the one with Cousin Eddie, right, the roadside shooting, that one's still in limbo. Then also, as you said, the sentencing for the federal financial crime. So good to know there are other things in play, not just the homicide retrial attempt yes. that they're trying to make here. Um, Eric, one thing that has just impressed me and so many of our viewers is how your clients, the Satterfields, have turned such a tragedy into something so triumphant and noble in that I remember you sharing the story that growing up, sometimes Christmas presents were a struggle for them. And we know that Gloria Satterfield worked really hard for the money that she earned from the Murdochs. And they've established a foundation, right? I know you shared it a while ago when um, you were on the show and we first started talking about it. Uh, would you kind of remind us about this? It's the perfect time in the season of giving to think about it. Sure, sure. Um, as you saw, the family is very Christian based, uh, very religious. They, they all have forgiven Alex. Um, they don't forget what he's done, but they have absolutely forgiven him based on their Christian faith. I'm an Old Testament guy. I'll never forgive him for what he did, but they wanted to uh, make sure that Gloria didn't die in vain. And they, they established the Gloria's Gift Foundation that was originally funded by $50,000 from them, $20,000 from us, and some other donations. And now it's a self-sustaining charitable foundation because it's getting other uh, gifts along the way. And it gives out Christmas gifts to needy families in the Hampton County area. They apply to the foundation and, you know, kids get bikes, uh, kids get clothes, food, and it's just a worthy cause. And it, it, Gloria now will live in infamy of, of her death being something good. You know, yesterday we saw Alex again really try to stick a, a, a stake in the heart of this family. I said that Gloria helped raise the children. And that is exactly what she did. She helped raise uh, Paul and Buster. He came back when he spoke and he t looked at me and said, I want you to know Gloria didn't raise those kids. Maggie and I raised the kids. And that was really a stake in the heart because Paul absolutely loved um, Gloria. She was around all the time. Just so you know, Alex wasn't really around all the time. Alex was out. Uh, out and about. He was a, a, you know, clan hander who shook a lot of hands and went to dinners, went to parties, really was somebody who um, played, played his relationships and used relationships. So um, this way, Gloria now lives um, in infamy. Uh, people of underprivileged means will have Christmas gifts for years to come. And it's a really good thing. It sure is, Eric. Uh, bravo to your clients for doing that. Um, we are so impressed by them and their generosity. And you're right, that was a low blow. That comment he made uh, to you and to Tony and the family uh, really stinks. 
really, really stinks. And I think it just goes to what you know we we know to be the case with him. It's all about serving himself. Uh, you touched on this earlier, Eric, how he used this as as a platform, uh, laying the groundwork for his defense. It's exactly my thoughts of of what he was doing yesterday. And I've got a clip where he's kind of blaming the financial crimes for the reason he was convicted of the two homicides. Let's take a look. I now apologize to every single person who cares about Maggie and about Paul. Because I know that the things that I did that I'm pleading guilty here today allowed SLED <coughs> and the Attorney General's office to focus on me. Everybody else's fault, right? Um, Eric, you're very close to uh, these allegations that the defense team has made because you represent several of the, the jurors who, who served on that case. Um, sharing what you can with us, um, everybody wants to know, is it likely we're going to see a new trial? Uh, we were reporting this morning the news uh, from Fitz News about uh, investigations sure. into Becky Hill's conduct. What do you think the likelihood is that Murdoch will be given a retrial. Well, in addition to blaming um, SLED and the AG uh, and the financial crimes, he blamed the media and then people like me who are also podcasters, and that was more than I can stomach. But he is entitled to a fair and impartial trial, and that's what makes us a great country. Even the worst of us will get that fair and impartial trial. Um, I believe that he did get a fair and impartial trial. Um, in talking with jurors, I got the impression that the financial crimes, um, while they were disgusting to them, it had nothing to do with their uh, vote of guilty. What had to do with the vote of guilt was the uh, failure of him to disclose that he was at the kennels. The kennel video really killed him. The timeline killed him. Uh, but really what stuck out with a lot of the jurors was um, he had no blood on his clothes when he, uh, the police arrived at 10.06. And he took 42 minutes to call Buster. And he called friends. He called family members. He called friends of Paul. He looked at his phone. He texted some messages and did an internet search before he called Buster. So that and the Snapchat video with him and Paul at 745, those were the things that caused the vote of guilt. The, the financial crimes and the pretrial publicity, all that stuff, the garbage that Harputlian and, and Griffin have peddled, really didn't um, have a lot to do with the jury. Um, I didn't hear anybody say uh, that, ju that Becky Hill did anything improper. We'll have to wait and see. I think eight or nine jurors are going to say she did not do anything improper. But if it turns out that Becky crossed the line, then um, he, he would be entitled to a new trial. A absolutely. Mm -hmm. A spot on analysis from you as always, my friend, Eric Bland. So good to have you on the program. It's been a busy 24 hours for you. My goodness, get some sleep. Thank you so much for making time for us this morning. Talk to you soon. Sounds good.